Hey, Taj, thanks so much for uh, coming on the podcast, mate. It's been, um, yeah, really looking forward to your episode. Thanks for having me, Ben. Uh, looking forward to it. Yeah, awesome. Um, and my first question is always to tell us a bit about your family. Family? Yeah, sure. All right. So mum was brought up in England. She followed a very, very traditional pathway in the sense she was in university for like forever um, then went to an internship, went back to university, then went to a junior job, senior job, and stayed in employment. And she loves it, um, mm. which is great. Um, and that, that 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 was good for her. Um, dad, on the other hand, was brought up in East Africa, he, in Kenya. Uh, dad couldn't afford to go to university and went straight into employment um, from school. Um, so I had two real opposing parents where, like, I didn't want any of those pathways. Like, I was quite happy to sit in school somewhat. Um, Mum wanted me to follow a traditional path like she did. Um, mm. And as a student who was on, like, three suspensions by grade six, I was having, <laughs> right, like, literally none of it. Um, you were the back row dad, bandit. It was terrible. Like, it's not, <laughs> it's not like I was, like hugely or I was actually disruptive but it, it wasn't like with groups of people I was I just did not enjoy being there I couldn't see why I was there so found every other reason not to be there or to do something else whilst whilst the teacher was teaching yeah um, so mum kind of came from a background where she wanted me to to follow what what she did a nice traditional pathway I come from an Indian Indian background as well so from a grandparent's point of view, it was be a doctor, be a lawyer. Um, <laughs> and that was definitely like, I couldn't be either of those things from a grades point of view. And the idea of like dressing up in a suit all day, like was just horrible. Um, and I really didn't find playing on the insides of people that interesting either. Mm. Um, so growing up, like I had two parents who were very, uh, alternate with their thoughts of what they wanted for me um but the general consensus was don't get expelled and i was on probation so i was definitely pushing the boundaries uh, from both of their uh, visions for their first child <laughs> uh dear. there you go and how did they meet out of interest so good question uh, they met in england actually um yeah. my dad actually his, his, the first time he ever got on a plane was when he was like 25 years old yeah, wow. and his first trip was was, was to england and uh, in that trip or subsequent trips, he, he met my mother and they decided um, let's move to, to a country that we don't have. They originally moved back to, to East Africa where he was from and decided that the crime in Kenya was a little extreme to raise a child. Um, and they thought yeah. let's be a country that is just, we've got no, no support mechanisms. Let's, let's start afresh. Um, and they moved to Australia. Wow. There you go. That's um, that's a big step from, from sort of Europe and Africa over to here. Absolutely. Um, no, I'm I'm absolutely glad they did. I I, I love the country. Mm. Yeah, awesome. And and so could you paint a bit of a picture for us then? So you you're kind of a bit of a rebel at school. How how did that sort of end? <laughs> um, and and what what happened after that? <laughs> well, like the things I was doing in the classroom, like I wasn't necessarily picking lots of fights with other kids. Like it wasn't that sort of naughtiness. I was like, I was a nerd, um, not a very book smart one, but I loved being on computers. So um, like the way I would get into trouble was by having naughty things on my computer or giving things <laughs> to like in like illegal music or, or games. Oh, okay. um, <laughs> I was nine. Um, and, <laughs> Uh, it was yeah. sort of like it was just like I was just bored Ben like yeah. I really just wanted to start my career straight away um, mm. I was bored in the classroom um, and from like grade two to about grade six I genuinely did not see the purpose in what we were doing so long division for example um, <laughs> I, I was a nerd I had mm. I loved playing with electronics I loved playing with um, just any form of electronics. And my idea of a perfect weekend, um, like my sister was a very academic child, loved mm. all the co-curricular activities. Mum and dad would drop her to like every co-curricular every day of the week. Um, I didn't want to do co-curricular activities because my idea of fun was dropping me to a department store and I would sit in JB Hi-Fi or Harvey Norman for an extended period of time and play on every single machine yeah. um, because that's what I really enjoyed. I loved it. Um, mm. And that was literally my weekends. 
um, that that's what I really, really wanted to do. Um, and school didn't give me the capacity or give me the freedom to do that. Mm. Uh, or even the time outside of the classroom um, to actually entertain the thought of doing something um, bigger than just school. And just was getting into trouble with like not focusing. And I think the biggest, I think the, the day I realized that school might not necessarily be the place that I find success was when we were learning long division. Um, and I think now looking back at the idea of long division, um, like I just could not get my head around the fact that we were, we, we were the tech generation. I started in school with computers. Um, it was very normal for my generation to be using electronics multiple times throughout the day um, and at, with a calculator. And the idea of spending a whole term teaching kids about long division, which was a skill that was not necessarily based on um, your problem solving, your ability, your ability to adapt, your ability um, to, to really understand a topic, but rather your ability um, to follow uh, a knowledge-based um, mm -hmm. instruction and uh, an instruction that machines were doing far quicker, far more efficient and far more accurate. Mm -hmm. um, and I just couldn't get my head around it. Um, and I think through school, that was a consistent thing. Well, why I'd much rather be in school to learn the things that um, I couldn't learn myself or a machine couldn't do. Yeah. Um, so from a maths point of view, teach me about problem solving because all of these basic equations can be done with a calculator. Um, and school didn't want to teach me that. Um, yep. So I was looking for alternative pathways. Yeah. Okay. And did you find you were kind of, you just understood that stuff quickly and therefore um, you, you, you'd mastered it in, in a fraction of the time um, and you just wanted to move on or was it that you, you just actually weren't good at it, but you knew something else could do it? Just, um, oh gosh. Like I wasn't a very book smart kid, like in exams, I'd still be a CD student then. Yeah. Uh, but in, when it came to certain subjects, so English, I loved writing stories. There you go. Um, when it came to maths, when it was based around uh, real world situations, that's when I was doing really, really well. Got it. Um, it, was, it was all the things that were, when I actually found an interest in it, I did really, really well. Yeah. Um, it was the things that I was just like, what is the point? I was literally a C and D student. Um, yeah. <laughs> it was a problem because like C's, I guess, like you, you, uh, George Bush said that, uh, C grade students get by, right? Um, for all for all the C grade students, you two can be president, but the D's <laughs> were the problem. Um, mm. And I think like just consistently failing certain subjects were um, were were quite unfortunate, especially for mum and dad. Um, and I think it was just I I could not see the point, and I put very little effort into actually completing anything. And finally, when I saw the point in certain things, and they were the project-based learning tasks, so unit of inquiries. Um, that's where I was far more interested, and those were the subjects I did really well in. And, and, and so, um, yeah, could, could you walk us through towards the end of school? like what? And, and maybe context for the audience, when did you finish school? What year? So I finished school in 2016. Um, yep. So I'm 20, 22 now. Um, mm -hmm. I ended up finishing school. Mum and dad didn't let me drop out of school, which was great. I'm glad they didn't. Um, I had a couple of businesses from school. So at the age of nine, I had my first tech blog. So instead of just sitting and not listening in the classroom, I was sitting and not listening to what the teacher was saying, but I was writing electronic reviews at the back of the classroom for the tech I was playing with at the department stores. And I started when I was nine, had that till I was about 11 or 12 years old. Um, which was a great experience. I was no longer on probation at school because I was, I actually found something I was interested in. Yep. Um, had a, another business throughout school, 56 Creations, which was all about teaching young people about digital literacy and mm -hmm. graduated um, uh, running that business alongside high school um, and then ended up running that business um, for a few years after that, um, which was cool. So um, yeah, it was kind of, as soon as I had my own business, I re-engaged in mainstream education. It gave me that outlet to do something that was a bit bigger than just school. Yeah, cool. But you had to relate it to the, something you're actually interested in rather than just get told a standard curriculum. It, and I wasn't sitting in school to get grades. I was sitting in school to learn skills that I wanted to know that would help me in business. Yeah. I knew what I wanted to do. I found my passion and I wanted to do a lot of it. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I was sitting at school, like the subjects I took in grade 12 weren't the subjects I was very good at. They were the subjects I was genuinely interested in. Um, and I think like that's probably one of the biggest problems we have in school right now that school was here to prepare us for the real world. Instead, we've now got young people literally there to get good grades. And that's all fine and good. Um, but if school's purpose was to prepare us for the real world, that there is a significant divide between the things that school's teaching us versus what we as human beings actually need to know in the workforce of the future. Mm. Uh, awesome, and, and I think we'll get to um, your what, what you're doing now in a sec. But do you have any sort of um, tips or, or things for for parents listening who might sort of observe similar things happening with their kids, like they might be really engaged in some subjects and not in others? Like any any sort of recommendations? <laughs> Look, I think the biggest one is obviously leave. If, if your child's academic, fantastic. Congratulations, you've got an academic child, and that's wonderful. Um, But for most young people, that's quite simply not the case. They're going to be getting Bs and C grades, and that's totally okay. Mm. Um, Like, there is a life outside of school. And if they start that life outside of school, whether it be in business and entrepreneurship, wonderful. Mm. Even if it's them having a casual job, and instead of getting A grades or B grades, they're getting C grades, but have a casual job from the age of 14. That's wonderful, because the relationships they're going to make from that job from a really young age or the communication skills or the financial literacy skills they're going to learn from having a job or being in a job is massive. That, that That's not skills you can get. No one's going to grade you on that skill in school, but as soon as they leave the classroom, that's what employers are looking for. They want someone who's had real world experience and perhaps just encouraging your young person or your child to, to go get that first job um, because it's very clear. I know with the, the staff that we hire, and I'm sure it's uh, similar with, with you guys, the, the young ones that have had a job from the age of 14 have far better customer service and people mm-hmm. skills than the ones who may have focused really hard in school and then got a job at the age of 21 after they graduated from university. Yeah. Um, I think the second one, even just how to raise an entrepreneur or a young person or a creative young person is the teaching of financial literacy at home. Um, my mm-hmm. parents taught me about financial literacy. And I didn't even know they taught me until I started hiring lots of other young people and they had no clue. Um, We were teaching these skills to young people, Mm. but mum and dad from a really young age taught me about the value of money. Mm. Um, They always encouraged me to work. They always encouraged me um, even just talk, having basic budgeting discussions from a really young age. I didn't know this was... uh, other kids didn't have this. I was just brought up in an environment where mum and dad spoke about money at home. They talk about the various investments they were making. They spoke about um, the various sort of financial decisions they were making at home. Um, And I think just subconsciously, I was listening to all of this stuff and um, it absolutely helped me when I, when I started. Yeah. How good. Oh, cool. And, and so oh, there's a cat in the background. <laughs> Working from home. Yeah, we that's... adopted him, actually. His name's George. He's a beautiful, beautiful oh. Persian cat. Oh, mm. lovely. We had two of those when we were growing up. <laughs> so fluffy. Um, cool. Uh, and so take us through your thought process and how you came to start the Australian School of Entrepreneurship. Yeah, definitely. Well, the Australian School of Entrepreneurship was really was the first initiative within the AC group. Um, It was sort of the initiative that I always wanted in school. Um, My biggest problem with school was it didn't teach me, it didn't prepare me for the real world and I didn't learn the skills I needed for the real world. Um, And when we asked lots of other young people, I wasn't an isolated instance. Most young people finish school without the adulting 101 skills they need in the real world. Um, so the idea of the Australian School of Entrepreneurship was to really provide young people with the adulting skills they needed to thrive. Um, and that's exactly what we're doing. We do that through three initiatives within the group, the Australian School of Entrepreneurship, which is all about school workshops, online education, um, and called youth partnerships. Um, mm. We've got the Australian School of Employment, which is contracted by state government, federal government, and local council to deliver self-employment programs. And then we've got our business camp school holiday program. So instead of going to like basketball camp or, or chess camp, like growing up, mum and dad sent me to some horrible school holiday programs. Like they work full, full, full time. And like, I hated these programs. 
I just wanted to sell things for three days. Um, so that's exactly <laughs> what we created. We created a business game that runs all across the country. And in three days, the kids learn about the highs and lows, love and pressure of the world of business, which is pretty cool as well. Mm, ah, cool. And, and so could you give us some examples of, um, and, and I'm guessing kind of many businesses are started out of these camps. Like what are some of the results of these, these um, few days that kids spend together? Yeah, definitely. All right. So we kind of, um, across the group initiatives, we really get the young people to focus on micro businesses. Yep. We, don't, we think like kids pitching global solutions is fantastic and it's very cute, but mm. they don't do anything about it, um, which is a problem. Um, <laughs> get to identify local problems yep. and brainstorm micro business solutions. Um, and what we find is the kids actually start them because if they're not, if they don't require millions of dollars to start, um, who would have known they actually start them? Um, mm. And we've had some, uh, we've got Emily in, uh, in, in Melbourne. She grew up um, in a low-income household um, where she faced, uh, or her mother in particular faced, period poverty. Um, and her idea, she was the winner of our Westpac Youth Impact Challenge last year. And mm. she pitched an idea um, which would be uh, sort of gamifying raising money for 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 pads um and she's now distributed more than like 16 15 or sixteen thousand pads um and she's like 15 years old um and this was just a girl who experienced period poverty or a family experienced period poverty firsthand she was a single parent um mm. and emily her daughter 15 years old um thought how how can i start this and she gamified the way in which we fund or raise money for for people who don't have access to sanitary products mm. um, and to distribute like literally 15 or 16 thousand pads is ridiculous for yeah. someone who's not even legally allowed to start a, uh, or be a director of their own company um we've got our <laughs> epac boys in noosa um they yeah. um saw well we've got a significant problem with plastics uh, pollution in, mm. in Musa. Um, and these were like, I think nine years old when we first met them and they wow. identified plastic pollution as a problem. And they started the EPAC, a world's first tourism, uh, eco tourism kit, which included like a coconut bowl, a spork, um, an upcycled beach towel, um, like uh, reusable coffee cup, etc. cetera. Um, and they ended up pitching their idea to the former <laughs> US vice president, Al Gore, um, and they've now sold um, hundreds, if not thousands, of these EPACs across the country. It's stocked in their Australia. And these kids were nine years old when they started the business, um, which was awesome. And they all came through um, one of our ASC programs. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And, and could you run us through what the, I guess, what the programs are that you offer? Mm, yeah, definitely. Well, I think across all of our programs, the simple foundation is um, we get the students to identify a problem that mm. actually means something to them, um, whether it be in their local community or global community. Mm. Um, we want them to do something in their local community because it's a lot more personal. They can see it, they can touch it, they can experience it, or they have experienced it. And then we work with the students just through basic ideation principles to identify micro business solutions. We take the students through um, making sure their idea is actually feasible, market research, helping them put it into an elevator pitch, business yes. pitch, help them find um, whether it's investment in kind support, uh, revenue, if it is just a direct sell to consumer initiative, um, all the way to helping them after, after launch. So how do we get more revenue for these business ideas? How do we make these business ideas scale? Um, and we take them from the very start of, starting an idea all the way to how do we actually get these students investment ready or um, how do we make these ideas actually scale? Um, and last year uh, through our alumni, um, they collectively made more than $600,000 of revenue or income or in-kind support from, from the programs, which is pretty awesome um, because they weren't just ideas, they actually made real income from these mm. ideas. Mm. Um, yeah, <laughs> I, I once heard a, uh, interesting, like how, how solving actual problems, um, turns into dollars and it's not necessarily yeah. what they're doing because of that, but, um, uh, a mentor of mine says, um, people pay money for you, for you to solve their problems. And in, and if you're causing them problems, people pay money for you to go away. Just exactly. <laughs> well, side, side like, note. These kids, like as you, these kids are literally starting businesses that none or quite a few of them probably won't change the world in any capacity mm. like our most recent logan program 
Um, a kid literally just said, well, we've got a shortage of gardeners in Logan that charge less than $50 an hour. Getting paid $50 an hour as a 16 year old is nuts. So they said, well, we're not going to charge $50 an hour. We're going to charge 40, 35 to $40 an hour for our gardening services. And he started a landscaping gardening business. Mm. That's not going to change the world, but it's an income generating micro business that's mm. solving a market need in Logan. And he's making money, which is incredible. Yeah. Um, and how so old is he? 16. Um, he went, he goes to uh, Woodridge State High School, I believe. Um, and the, the local member uh, actually bought him a lawnmower for him to start his, his business as well. And he goes around, Mo Cuts is his business. He actually came over to my place a few weekends ago awesome. and he just mows people's lawns um, and it's a problem. Um, mm. And he's solving it with his uh, lawn mowing and uh, landscaping business. How good. Okay. And, and so how, like, I mean, you know, my, my kids are a bit young now. They're, they're um, 10 months and almost three is, is our oldest. Um, so they're, they're a little bit away from school, but like how, well, maybe first question is like, what, what are your, what's your guidance to, to parents on how to raise entrepreneurial kids? Like really just encourage what it, like if, I really think especially the, the idea of young people working from a young age is mm. fundamental. I am so glad mum and dad let me start from a young age. Mm. Um, and it like even if it, they don't start a business, going into a casual job makes a difference to um, the ability for that young person to communicate um, after they they leave school. So just encouraging that young person to go and kind of work. Yep. Um, obviously, if they, if they work for themselves, they can start at any age. But certainly if the idea is they, they want to go and get a casual job, let them do that as soon as they're, they're legally allowed to. Yeah. Um, I think even just as an easier one, from a young age, mum and dad always got me to give the table order to the waiter or um, yeah. the, the front counter. And um, for, as a young person, like it's really daunting, like an eight-year-old going up to the counter and ordering something. Like I hated it. Yeah. Um, but I'm so glad they did because I um, like even when things say something went wrong with the order, mum and dad asked me to go and say, well, we didn't order that. Could you please replace it? Or mm. hey, we're waiting on X. Um, and what like they made me, they put me in situations where I kind of had to um, learn people skills. Um, yep. And that wasn't from like 15. That was from when I was a really, really young kid. Yeah. Um, and that's something that we, like, as parents, that's something very easy when if you're ordering something at a restaurant, get the child to order. Um, it's daunting as a young person to go up and order, but the things they'll learn from having a conversation with an adult, um, even just mirroring the way in which they communicate will teach them something. Um, mm. When you're like, not that anyone orders a pizza anymore via phone, but um, if you're ordering a pizza via phone, get the child to do it. Um, get the child to talk on the phone because just getting them a bit more comfortable on the phone from a really young age um, is just starts them off earlier because you can't learn confidence or communication from a textbook. You learn that yep. from experimentation. If they can start experimenting from the age of six, that really will create a really holistic young person with the skills they need. Yeah, how cool! That's uh, that's very unexpected, but so good. I think if I let Rose Rose order our um our breakfast, we'd have about twelve dozen. Uh, no, actually, that's that's a dozen dozen. There's my All long right. long multiplication. Um, <laughs> we'd have it anyway. I think is that 144. <laughs> but anyway, we'd have a lot of baby chinos. Uh, she just ordered so many of them, but anyway. <laughs> um, and so, okay, so we've, um, yeah, so, so sort of give them a nudge to engage in communication. Uh, I love that you've sort of said that, that the, the job is like, you haven't even once sort of mentioned that the, the reason to go and get one is to, you know, pay their way a little bit or um, earn a bit of money for pocket money, but it's it's actually more about their life development that they might get sort of seven, eight, nine years head start on to someone who just does school, finishes that, goes to uni, learns theory for another three or four years, and then gets their first job. Like they, they've just got such, they've got almost a decade head start on that. Totally, and yeah, of course, like the money is great for young people. That yeah. way, they're not being funded by their parents. Like, um, like I've got quite a few mates who who whose parents sort of said. 
if you get good grades, we'll fund you through school. Um, we'll give you your allowances and whatnot. I think that's ridiculous because that never happens in the real world. Like your mm. boss is not just going to say like, oh, if you don't work this week and you do really well um, with your with, with your study, <laughs> you, you'll get paid. Or yep. uh, like it, it is just senseless um, mm. paying your child through or giving your child an allowance through school. Um, and mum and dad never did that with me. I think it's great um, because I had to find ways to make money for myself. Um, and that's why... Yep. I decided self-employment was the pathway for me from the age of nine. Um, but <laughs> like, it, like, yes, the money is important, but the, the overall holistic skills, um, like that's, that's priceless, right? Mm. Um, that's an education you can give to your child without literally doing anything. Um, they're the ones flipping burgers or whatever else they're doing um, in their casual jobs. They're doing the hard work whilst learning some awesome as skills. Yeah, oh, very cool. Um, and tell us how, um, like, it seems like you've met quite a few interesting people um, in, in the world. Tell us how you came to meet, like, Al Gore and Will Smith and even the uh, the Prime Minister of Australia. Yeah. Well, yeah, that all happened. <laughs> Will Smith's one was pretty cool, actually, because I was travelling. I was on a study tour with Westpac. Um, yep. and we were doing, like, it was part of the Business of Tomorrow program, and we were going through the US and Shanghai and whatnot. And on the way back from, um, I think, Seattle, we were on the way from Seattle to Shanghai and in the airport lounge, um, Will Smith. I, so I walked into the bathroom, first of all, and <laughs> Will Smith was there on like in the trough area, which was incredible. And I was like, well, oh, this is kind of random. Um, and it was like just so like so normal, wasn't wearing a hoodie. Just it was just Will Smith. Um, and you never say, like, it was just random. So I went to the bathroom and I was like, hey, g'day, um, et cetera. Um, and then finally, when, when he came out, he was sit, sat right behind us. Um, Jeez. And we said, hey, can, can we have a chat? And um, like, he was more than happy to have a chat. In fact, he was like, he was so quotable and it was incredible. And I can't even remember what I said because it was just so <laughs> random seeing Will Smith there. And he was just so generous with his time and was, um, like we we had hash browns, we it was it was incredible, and we was just sitting in this airport um, with Will Smith. Jaden Smith came over. Yeah, wow. um, it was honestly incredible. It was um, just totally random, actually. Um, and um, we had a great chat. We spent about forty minutes um, in an airport with like the Will Smith, and yeah. everything he said was just so beautifully quotable, um, which was w w really was wonderful for a celebrity to be as cool as they seem. Mm. even off camera and off interviews this guy was just genuine um we wow. ran some cool, we ran a cool youth challenge with the state government a couple of years ago um called the minister's climate challenge and mm. um where we got young people to identify problems in their community to do with climate and brainstorm solutions and our goal was going to be in brisbane at the time and we kind of mm. We're chatting to the state government and thought, what's well, something that we could do that's cool with young people, young Queenslanders, um, and someone like Al Gore, who's like never in Brisbane. Um, yeah. and they agreed to it, which was epic. So we had like 15 kids and us present their business ideas to Al Gore. And then Al Gore gave feedback um, to <laughs> the kids and the EPAC boys I spoke about earlier um, mm. were one of the kids that got to, or one of the groups that actually got to present to, to Al Gore and Brizzy. Um, and to just have like an opportunity for like us, absolutely. It was an honor to be part of that. Um, but even just an opportunity for kids that we were able to sort of mold, present their idea to not just like the minister for environment who was also there, which was great. Um, but to have a global figure in environmental science, listen to the next gen of young Queenslanders, honestly, it was just nuts. Um, so we've been very lucky to, to have, to, we've been lucky to to have some really cool people interact with with our organization actually hmm. yeah that is awesome and, and how about scomo how did that come about <laughs> yeah like again like i think when you start a business when you're young you just bump into really really cool people um i was lucky enough a couple of years ago um to be awarded the queensland young australian of the year award and as part of that, um, kind of the, the award, we were invited to the PM's place for coffee. Um, and like I was 16 or 17. Um, <laughs> and just being, and that was um, Malcolm Turnbull's time. Um, mm -hmm. And kind of just 
like the day we caught up with him um, at his place at, at the lodge in Canberra was mm. literally the morning after the, he spoke to Donald Trump for the first time um, about about the refugee settlement deal, which was obviously a very contentious thing. And if you read the reports, mm. that was the day when there was a significant disagreement between um, President Trump and uh, PM Turnbull. And we m- met him a few hours after that phone call. Mm. And it was insane. Like this guy was just like, Malcolm Turnbull's eyes were red. He looked like he had, like, it, he looked like a little, it was just, it was insane, actually. And um, we've just been able to meet some really cool people. Like, it was mm-hmm. a random day meeting him. He was barely talking. He was totally preoccupied. And then mm-hmm. the new PM came over. Uh, Scott Morrison was was brought in. And the um, first time we met him was, he was literally just in the lobby of our office. I was walking in from a meeting and he was in the lobby and then met him in Canberra after budget week. We've just been able to meet some really cool people. And I think as a young entrepreneur, these people want to meet you. Um, Mm. And like, it just made life so much easier, especially with meeting politicians because getting meetings with some of these people has been a bit tricky. I understand with older people, but as a young person, like, they're quite happy to meet the next gen. Um, so we've been really, really lucky. Um, so it's been great. Mm. Yeah, fantastic. Um, and so if you're if you're a, a, listening to this podcast and you're keen to know, like, how, how do I get my kids into these programs or, or to learn about this stuff? Um, is it location-based? you have to be in a certain area? Do you have to be in a certain school? Like, how does that work? Yeah, definitely. So we've got school-based programs as well as programs that parents can register for, register their kids for. Yep. Um, so if you just head to asc.edu.au, we've got our online education that you can sign up for, or we've got our business camp school holiday program. So you just type in business camp in Google and we've got business camps all across the country, virtual camps, face-to-face camps, awesome. and three days where parents can just register their kids for a, for a whirlwind three days of business and entrepreneurship. Yeah, how good. Um, really, really cool, mate. And, and is there anything else you'd like to sort of share or, or um, stuff that we might not have covered in a bit of detail? No, I think that's pretty good, actually. Mm. That's, that's impressive. No, I am. Um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm definitely keen. I mean, you know, it's kind of that bias where, you know, I've started my own business. My, my dad did, my, my grandfather did. Um, and, and I, uh, you know, not that you want to sort of necessarily force your kids to do something, but I definitely want to give them those sort of opportunities and that's given me so much clarity personally so um just thank you taj um i i hope uh, other uh, people who are listening also got lots out of it and um yeah if people want to follow we've got the ase website we'll put that in the show notes but if people want to follow you and what you're doing what's the best way to um to do that yeah definitely well you can catch me on instagram just my full name taj fabari or or, or, or facebook or linkedin i'm on all of the socials, um, but no, happy to happy to chat if any of your listeners want to want to chat more. Yeah, fantastic. And is that um, tech blog still? Sorry, tech blog still up and running? It's not. It's uh-huh. not. As soon as I started my fifty six creations, which was teaching kids about digital literacy, yeah. I managed to sell the domain for a few thousand dollars, which was Ooh. awesome. Um, because like I started that bit, the the next business when I was thirteen, so to have a few thousand dollars just to start. Mm. Um, was incredible. So no, it's no longer around, um, but I'm very glad that it started because I was getting like, had some cool Google ads and managed to sell the domain in the end, which was cool. Awesome. <laughs> cool stuff. Well, thanks again, Taj. Really enjoyed having you on. And uh, yeah, um, we'll be in touch soon. Cheers, mate.